So the first thing you want to do when working with a financial calculator is set your number of decimal periods. So typically when you first get it and turn it on, it's going to be defaulting to two decimal places. And you want to do more than that. So to reset it, you're going to go to second, which is the yellow button, the period. Right now mine's set to eight, so I'm just going to switch this to six. So I'm going to type six, then press enter. Now I can do a second compute, so the yellow button, then the button right above it, and that does the quit option up there. So now I'm just back at the home page. Now in this type of calculator, whenever you solve a new time value of money function, the first thing you want to do is you want to clear out whatever you solved before. So there's two places you want to clear. So first you want to click second, the yellow button, and then future value over here on the right hand side. And what that does is it clears all your time value of money calculations. So it clears anything that was previously set into these buttons. The second thing you want to do is you want to clear your work. So you want to do second and then the clear button down here in the bottom corner. That clears out anything you are currently calculating. So those are the two buttons you want to clear whenever you start one of these problems. Starting with a single cash flow, if we look at problem one, so in this problem, we have 41 is our N, 5%, $5,000 is our present value, and then we're calculating what our future value is. So the buttons we're going to be using are these white ones right across this row. And the way you input them is you type in the number first, and then you press on the button. So for instance, for 41, I type in 41, then I would press my N value. Next up, I'm going to do 5%. And in these calculators, you type it in as a percentage, not as a decimal. So I type in five, then press on I over Y. Next up, I'm doing my present value. So I'm gonna type in 5,000. And here again, either your present value or your future value needs to be negative. So I like to think of it as I'm investing $5,000 at the beginning. So I'm losing $5,000, then at the end, I'm getting back whatever that future value is. So that would be a positive number. So I'm going to type in 5,000, then I'm going to press this plus minus sign down here at the bottom of the number keypad. That makes it negative. Then set it as my present value. Now I'm going to clear out of this menu. I just leave the payment option exactly as, as it is. I don't set anything for that. So to get out of this menu, I'm going to do second compute that quits me out of this menu. Then I'm gonna press on the compute button. And now when I click on future value, it's gonna give me the future value of that cash flow. So it's $36,959. Let's look at another example. So problem two was the college education problem. So we know we need a future value of $200,000 in 10 years with a rate of 7%. So what is our present value? So again, before I solve this problem, I'm going to quit out of my previous one. So I'm going to do second quit, and then I'm going to clear those two menus. So I'm going to do second, click on future value, so clear my time value of money. Then I'm going to do second, clear work. So I've cleared everything out from the last problem. Now I'm going to do 10 as my number of periods. 7 is my percentage. Present value is what we're solving for. Payment, I don't have a payment in this option, so I'm just gonna leave that button alone. Don't type anything in there. And then I'm gonna do 200,000 for my future value. Now again, I'm gonna quit out of this menu, so I'm gonna do second, compute, then click on the compute button one more time. And now when I click on present value, it gives me the value of negative 101,669. So that's the amount I would have to invest today to end up with the future value of 200. Okay, perfect. So now, oh yeah, so if I just hit future value, which I just did, I accidentally just set the future value to be that number. So don't do that. So now we're gonna quit out of this menu. I'm gonna do second, clear time value of money, second, clear work. So for this last one here, you recently sold a home that you purchased seven years ago. Purchase price was $250,000, selling price was $315,000. So what is the annual interest rate? So again, clear time value of money, clear work. Seven is my number of time periods. The interest rate is what I'm solving for. I have $250,000 is my present value, and I'm gonna make that one negative. Then set it as my present value. 
I leave my payment alone, and then my future value is gonna be 315,000. Now I'm gonna quit out of that menu, hit compute, and then click on my percentage. So I get 3.36%. Now I'm gonna quit out of this menu again. And I always make sure to clear all those things. So next up for uneven cash flows, this is probably the trickiest thing to solve in these financial or graphing calculators. So the first option for how to solve these is that you could discount each one individually. So I could say I have a future value of 200 discounted back one year at a rate of 5%, then add it to $100 discounted back two years and use this menu to solve each basically cash flow of the problem, then add them all together. The other option is you can use the NPV formula. So the way you're going to get here for these problems is you're going to click on this cash flow button. So right next to the second button, and it's going to say cash flow zero. So that's our initial cash flow button. So we don't have anything there. So we're just leaving it as zero, right? We have no cash flow at time zero. So I'm just going to press enter, then down. So I'm pressing this down arrow over here. Now it's asking me what cash flow one is. So my cash flow one is $200. I'm gonna press enter, then down. F01 stands for the frequency of that first cash flow. So how many times in a row does that first cash flow happen? In our case, that first cash flow of $200 only happens one time in a row. So the frequency is one. So I'm just press enter, down. Now it's asking for the second cash flow. So in this case, I type in 100, enter, down. That cash flow only happens one time in the series in a row. So here I'm going to do enter down. Cash flow three, 150, enter down. Only happens one time. Cash flow four, 400, enter down. Only happens one time, enter down. And now you don't have to go beyond there in this menu. So what you can do is now you're just going to quit out of this menu. So I'm going to do second compute. Now I'm going to click on NPV, the button right next to cash flow. My I value is 5%, so I'm going to type in 5, enter, down, and now it says NPV equals. So when I see this screen, I want to press compute, and I get the value of $739.86. So there are a couple tricky things here. So first, let me go back into my cash flow menu and clear this one out. So I'm gonna clear everything in here. So when I do that, make sure I clear both those things, specifically when I do the second clear work, that's gonna clear out all my cash flows that were previously in there. So you wanna make sure you do that before you solve any of these. So a couple things to keep in mind when you're typing these in. First is that, so in this example, right, we had a cash flow every single period. So we had a cash flow one, a cash flow two, a cash flow three, and a cash flow four. But what happens if let's say we had $200 the first year, $100 the second year, 150 the third year, then we skipped a year. So we got zero in year four, then 400 in year five. In that case, we would have to put in the zero as cash flow four. So I would have 200 is my cash flow one, happens one time. Cash flow two would be 100, enter down, happens one time. 150 is my cash flow three, happens one time. Then I would have zero as this cash flow, enter down, happens one time. Then cash flow five would be 400. Then I can quit out of that menu. Again, go over to NPV, five is my interest rate, enter down, compute that value. So that's something to keep in mind. If you don't have a cash flow in a period, you still have to type it in in the series of cash flows, right? You have to put in a zero as that value. The next thing to keep in mind that's really tricky about these problems are these frequencies. So you can only use the frequency option if you have two cash flows that are exactly the same in periods right next to each other. So let's say on my timeline, $200 was my first payment and $200 was my second payment. In that case, I could do 200 frequency two. That would then say what it thinks of that would be $200 the first year, $200 the second year. 
Then when I go down to the next cash flow and it says cash flow two, that's essentially cash flow three. So it can be a bit tricky when you have multiple cash flows that are the same and you're using that frequency option. So make sure to keep that in mind. Now the next thing we can do, first I'm just gonna clear this out, is we can solve annuities on these calculators. And how we're gonna do that is we're gonna use the payment option right here. So if we look at chapter five, part one, problem six, this was again the mortgage problem. So we could afford to pay $25,000 per year. We had a mortgage rate of 4%, 30 years. So first, all we're just gonna do is basically incorporate in the payment button. So I have 30 years, that's my end value. Four is my interest rate. My payment each period is gonna be 25,000. Then I just quit out of the menu, compute, present value. And I get that negative 432,000. So we can also solve annuity dues on these calculators. But one thing I would caution you of is that if you reset the calculator where the payments begin at the beginning of each period, so it is an annuity due, make sure when you're done solving that problem, you switch it back so the payment goes to the end of each period. Because you're basically switching up like the way the calculator is actually solving all problems from then on when you set this feature. So the way you switch the feature is first you're gonna go to, let me find it real quick. Okay, so the begin is right above payment. So I'm gonna do a second payment. And here we can say, it's see it's currently set to end. So if I wanna change that, I'm gonna do a second yellow button, enter. And now it's gonna say beginning. And you'll see now in the top corner of my screen, it also says BGN. So that tells me it's set to the beginning of each period. So even if I quit out of this menu and I go back to my home screen, it still says begin. So if your computer or your calculator says begin in that top right corner, that means you're solving everything as a do or as the payment occurs in the beginning of each period. If it doesn't say anything up there in the top corner, then it's solving things at the end of each period as an ordinary annuity. So in this case, in this example, we have $500 payments, we have a series of four of them, and we have a discount rate of 10%. So I just type in four as my end value, 10 as my percentage, 500 is gonna be my payment, and then I wanna quit out of this menu, hit compute, and then I can calculate what my present value is. So in this case, it's negative $1,743. Now, now that I'm done solving that, I'm gonna quit out of this menu. I'm gonna clear all my work. And then I wanna switch this back so it's the end of each period. I don't wanna leave it as the beginning. So to switch it back, I'm gonna do, do again second payment. So now it says begin. Second enter. Now it says end. And I can just quit out. So that beginning is gone in that top corner of the screen. So now we can solve everything again as an ordinary annuity. The last two things I wanted to mention is first, that there is no built-in function for a growing annuity. So those ones can really only be solved using the formula. Same with a growing perpetuity. And then for perpetuities in general, again, there is no built-in function for perpetuities. You can do the same thing as in Excel where you assume a large value for your number of periods, or you can just simply do the payment divided by the rate. Now, lastly, I just wanted to go through non-annual compounding. So the way we're gonna do this is exactly the same to the way we did this in Excel, where we basically wanna take into account the compounding before we type in what the different variables are. So first, let me show this with a single cash flow. So this was our problem from in class where we invest $50 today and we keep it invested for three years. And the rate we're earning is gonna be 12% compounded semi-annually. And it's asking for the future value. So my number of time periods is gonna be three years times two compounds per year. So first I'm gonna do three times two equals six. So that's gonna be what I type in for my number of periods. Then next for my rate, I have 12% compounded semi-annually. So my six month rate is gonna be 12 divided by two equals, then I set that as my I over Y value. Next up, I'm just gonna do $50 
as a cash outflow. I'm investing that today. It's my present value. Now I can quit out of this menu, hit compute, and here my future value is gonna be $70.93. So next up here, we have an annuity with non-annual payments. So this was our example where we could afford to pay $2,000 per month for the next 30 years towards a mortgage, and the interest rate was 4% compounded monthly. So again, just like the single cash flow, as we go across this row and we type in our inputs, we wanna take into account the number of payments and also the compounds on the rate before we type these in, right? So we wanna take it into account and then set it. So first let's start off with the number of time periods, or in this case, the number of payments. So we have 30 years, 12 payments per year. So I'm gonna do 30 times 12 equals 360. I'm gonna set that as my end value. Now next up for my rate, I have 4% compounded monthly. So I'm gonna take four divided by 12 equals, set that as my I over Y. $2,000 is my payment. Now I can quit out, hit compute, and here I'm gonna get a present value of negative 418,922. So that's how to take into account compounding when we're using the same time value of money functions. First, you wanna take into account that N times M or the I over M, and then use those values as your inputs.